Uh, so yes, I'm Jason, and um, I am super honored to be here. I, participatory medicine and research is, is something that I strive to do. Um, and my message is, is really one of hope that, and recognition that we really have developed an amazing capacity to solve health challenges. And really also how thankful I am, particularly now that I have three kids, uh, that I live in an era of antibiotics and vaccines and anesthesia and things like that, uh, which are really life-changing for many people and that we have a long way to go. Uh, but we have developed this really incredible capacity to solve health challenges. And I feel like we're at a point in history that we're on the cusp of being able to have a phase shift where we level up that ability and make this capacity available to individuals to solve health challenges based in their own personal lives, uh, for their loved ones, for their communities, um, and, uh, and, and the people all around them. And I think that this is really exciting. So my personal history is I am an associate professor, but I don't have a PhD or an MD, which allows me to actually get away with a lot of crimes of innovation. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that I, the thing that I sort of consider my skill is building communities, and I've done that a bunch of times uh, over the past ten years, typically around emerging technologies where we don't know how to use them, we think they're going to be important, but we have to build some sort of, you know, practice around what they're useful for, how we to deploy them, who's going to help us test them, and those sorts of really important questions. So I'm not actually really going to talk much about any of, any of my work, but really focus on this, this, this one idea that we do have an amazing capacity to solve health challenges, but I feel like we're sort of one hitch. I'm going to get to that hitch because I think that, that each and every one of you potentially has a role to play in solving uh, this problem and unleashing this capacity. Um, so my current project that I've been working on, it seems like forever now, but been we're doing this design strategy and building sort of MVP services and products for about three, a uh, little over three years now, and we actually can see the sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and this is sort of the newest barn raising uh, that I'm doing, or that we're gonna be building community, that we're, uh, and it's kind of a funny situation compared to the previous endeavors because we don't know how many people belong in the community, actually. So um, the, the main idea is to build a resilience project, is that, like, why is it that some people are better able to escape disease, is the general idea. And, and that we're, we're specifically going out into the world looking for people who have significant risk factors for disease, but then they don't manifest typical signs and symptoms, or they have some extraordinary ability to, to overcome uh, a disease uh, in interesting ways uh, that we haven't seen before. And so I'm just going to start with a story of a real uh, person uh, that was really the inspiration for this work. Um, and I think that what we're trying to do is sort of build a template uh, from this individual case and say, how can we do this systematically? And this is a guy named Stephen Crone who was a New Yorker. And he had some unique features about his health experiences. Uh, unfortunately, his partner was one of the first people to die of uh, AIDS in the United States and got sick in the late 70s um, when we didn't call it HIV or AIDS, we didn't know what it was. He actually died in 1982, his partner died in 1982, the year that we said, hey, AIDS is called HIV, it's infectious. And so Stephen uh, assumed that he was gonna die next and went and got tested you know, for HIV every year for many years and never displayed any symptoms. He says, this is weird. I don't know why I'm surviving. I've been, I was exposed to HIV for many years um, and then I never got the disease. And so, fortunately for him, uh, he actually had an uncle who was a physician. Turns out the Crohn's disease was he was a physician at Mount Sinai, where I currently work. 
And he said, you need to go find a scientist. And so Stephen Crone went and found this immunologist named Bill Paxton who ran an experiment, um, on, took some blood and basically took his cells in a dish and gave them a massive dose of HIV and then washed the HIV away and tested the cells for infection. There was no infection. And so the, the, the scientist was first like, wow, this is, sure, <laughs> you know, show me the, Show me, the, show me the evidence, and they, they came up with this experiment and tested it, and then, sure enough, this led to uh, some new understanding about the, how HIV actually infects. And in the 90s, they discovered that the reason why he was a resistant to HIV infection was because he had a specific mutation in the genome that was sort of the protein that's the docking station that HIV needs to bind to to get into the cell, like his was broken. And, uh, and that allowed him to be resistant to HIV. So then three drug companies jumped in, and one successfully developed a drug that was FDA approved in 2004. And so the story here is one of uh, a New Yorker raises his hand and says, hey, researchers, <laughs> there's something strange going on uh, with, with my health experience. It seems unusual. It might be interesting that we could lead to some new basic knowledge about HIV. Could somebody please help me solve this? And so, and there are many stories. I chose Stephen's story. But there, and these are some of my other really favorites. So I'm just going to put the names of these individuals and you can go look them up. But people who have similar stories like this across many diseases. Uh, Stephen Crone uh, is the one I, you know, I just talked about you know, in HIV, but there's also stories around resistance to Alzheimer's and cancer and cardiovascular disease uh, and that are really intriguing and that have actually led to new treatment for preventative strategies for individuals who have exceptional health experiences. And so basically what we had, well, the reason why I spent so much time building this out is because we had to sort of devise a way uh, to put out bat signals that says, hey, do you think you might have a health experience uh, that is unique, that you have risk factors that fail to manifest disease? Medical textbooks say you should be sick if you're not. You know, come talk to us. And then all of the channels. And along the way, this was really sort of the uh, accumulation of some of my other life experiences of building health research studies and recognizing that there are gonna be a lot of problems and hurdles that we have to face in actually rolling out a project like this. First of all, there's what I call the participation paradox, which is if you ask people what they care about, they, in, in countries around the world, health and healthcare are near the top. If you ask, Pew does a survey of trusted health professionals, healthcare workers, medical scientists are near the top. As you can expect, lawyers and marketers are, are near the bottom. And a lot of other professions are coming in, coming in the middle. Um, but even with those two things, people value health and healthcare, trust medical scientists and healthcare professionals, uh, among other conditions, uh, people don't sign up for organized health research uh, in large numbers. It's still a fringe activity in the United States. And part of the reason is because there are too few on ramps. The way that you get into healthcare research is if you get sick, you go to a doctor, get a diagnosis, and if that doctor part of, of, of an academic medical center, you might get an invitation. Also, our mental models around health research are, are really often related to getting access to experimental therapies. It's not, so it's sort of a, 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 the last resort. Uh, that's if I'm dying and first line care therapies don't work, maybe I'll sign up for a research study. It's not sort of research is the first step in solving a personal, family, or community health problem. And then also, if you do get in, your experience is really often terrible. And so one, one group did a survey of people who had signed up for organized health research studies and found that over 90% of those participants who went out of their way to sign up to volunteer for a study never learned about the outcomes of, of the actual trials themselves. And also, they lack depth. We heard this earlier uh, with the, the, pink, the pancreatic cancer trials, where it's sort of like, thank goodness I'm happily married, uh, but from what I hear, dating in New York City, where the, 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 there's so many fish in the pond, uh, in theory, that if your potential partner finds even one indication of a flaw, that they move on and they swipe to the next person. So often eligibility, eligibility uh, requirements are very narrow, and if you do go out there, you actually don't find any places to get your, to, to, to contribute. Um, but then also, the other thing that's funny and gets us is that we are, in so many other areas, making tremendous progress. You know, things are going from big to small. This is the first uh, EK, EC, ECG, uh, measuring the heart, and now that's, you know, that was the first one, and this is, uh, now that thing fits on your watch. Genomes have gone from, you know, a billion dollars a piece to less than a thousand dollars. 
And we go from elite access, this is the Whitehead, Whitehead Institute, just, just 15 years ago, sequencing the first human genome, and then it fit on your desktop, and now it's portable and disposable and plugged into your laptop to sequence DNA. And then, of course, we also have discovered that the six degrees of Kevin Bacon are, in fact, real, and that we've gone from living in isol isolation to being able to find, for better or for worse, people who are just like us uh, uh, more easily than we ever could. And so, um, I think the most exciting opportunities in medicine are really around bottoms-up innovation, and that we have this new ability to basically leverage all of these amazing capacities that we've developed to solve personal problems or solve the problems of loved ones. And I would just like to, to mention a few of these names, and I would recommend that you go look up their stories because they're really incredible. I'm only going to tell one really briefly. Um, but each of these are about individuals who are solving healthcare challenges, sometimes leading to really radical advances for their loved ones. And they've been able to sort of t grab onto this capacity and leverage it, and I think we're all on the cusp of doing that really widely. So Matt might, um, if, if you don't know his story, uh, he had a sick kid, and the clinician said, hey, this is amazing, we have a diagnosis, but unfortunately this is the first person we've ever seen that has this mutation, and it's not actionable. And he said, oh, not actual, rolls up his sleeves as dad. Turns out to be a professor of computer science and said, we'll see about that. So then he, he writes a 5,000 word blog post that, that went viral by getting some clickbait, a picture of an actor, and says, you know, I found the killer of my son, and then put every keyword around the symptoms of this disorder. Because right now there's only one patient, you can't do much research, research with one. And over the course of the next year, was able to find uh, uh, 50 patients around the world who had this disease, launch a research program, and then bootstrap that uh, by being, by more or less doing real-time science on Twitter and making connections all over the world, and found a group in Japan who was working on this pathway related to this mutation, and uh, over the course of the next four years, was actually able to find a drug available at Costco over the counter that, that, that he could give to his son that went from 100 seizures a day to zero. And this is his dad. Now he happened to be a computer science professional who was able to sort of leverage a lot of this capacity from a unique position, but I feel like we're, we're also on the cusp of being able to do this more broadly, and this is one of the most exciting times. But the hitch is that none of this is gonna happen uh, for your loved ones unless you take action. And so you're the key, that we have these capacities, but we have to use them, and it's not gonna work. Research even with the amazing progress that we see, that's easy to be passive and say, oh yeah, so I'm sure if I get sick, my loved one gets sick, or their disease goes from okay to worse later, there's gonna be a, an effective therapy or, or uh, waiting for us. <clears throat> and most of the time, that's just not true, I'm sorry to say. So I'm here to give you just a few ideas about ways that you, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, can roll up your sleeves and get involved because your loved ones uh, may rely on that. So thank you very much for having me. What's that? Oh, five minutes of QA. Okay, so we have uh, time for questions. Any questions? Raise your hand if you have questions, so we can run a microphone to you. Let's see who has one. So we can do a quick poll or way. How many people in this room uh, have? have actively participated in an organized health research study where you had to sign a consent form in the last year. That's pretty good. That's way more than most conferences where usually it's just sort of like the person that came with me is participating in the thing that I'm working on then. Uh, so let's go. Yeah, well, this is what they call selection bias, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You come to the Society for Participatory. You get a lot of particip participatorians. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I was, uh, Matt Mike's case particularly intrigues me because I focus on changing the culture which requires diagnosing what the heck is going on in the culture, yeah. right? Like why is it that scientifically trained people think that people without medical training, like Doug as one example, right? And, uh, Christina and Kate Sheridan and people without who aren't trained to be doctors or PhD researchers can actually do something useful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I so Matt is a PhD if I understand correctly. 
Yeah, but not in your size. Right? That's right. So do you do you have first of all, do you have an interest that I'm looking at you with grappling hook eyes here? <laughs> do you have an interest in hmm? diagnosing what the cultural obstacle is? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, you know, uh, I I have worked across uh, DIY communities and then academic research centers and nonprofits and on government projects and in the commercial world. And they each have their own uh, sort of phenotype. Um, but I feel like, um, I, I, I can't tell you, I think it's a, there are many, many aspects to this that largely, um, uh, it's really hard for, for academic researchers who, who are involved in healthcare and medical research, um, that we, we don't really have good systems. Uh, we don't have a two-sided network where there's like, you know, that, that works really well between patients uh, and, and uh, researchers, between the patients and the researchers, we just don't really have a good venue uh, to uh, give incentivize to academics who do a lot of the research to really work closely with individual patients. So mm -hmm. that it's really PI-driven funding, and so the ideas are then therefore PI-driven uh, from start to finish outside of a few exceptional areas like the quarry, um, or things that are existing outside of academic research. So I don't know if you were here, here earlier when I said that, like I'm an activist, I actually yeah. want change, like now would be good. Yeah. And so there are, but there are examples. Right. Yeah, like you mentioned some, and Janet is uh, a major ninja in the precision is sitting in front of you, the, the precision medicine movement, and we have like the Improved Care Now Network at Cincinnati Children's and so on. Yeah. What do we do, right, to crack open some skulls in the stodgy part of the scientific establishment? Well, I think that uh, you can operate at just any level and find low hanging fruit to get involved with. And that, and that amazingly, rusty stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I think I think I think governance. I think governance is another area where uh, you know people in research like to bang on IRBs. I joined an IRB. I've been on IRB for three years, so I can understand what the situation is with uh, with uh, with research participants, you know, subjects versus investigators, which is a dynamic that we're just starting to get over. But a lot of these systems are really disempowering from the very beginning, and that things like uh, basic rights uh, of individuals that we have in healthcare through activism, like access in law, we have access to your medical records. And even then, we know that the reality is even when it's law, you don't get a very good, high quality medical record that's available to you. So imagine in the research world where you don't have a right to that data. Imagine what you get, which is basically nothing. Um, unless you are have been able to find an academic researcher who is, you know, participant centered and says, hey, we need they need to have people see the table. And right now, it's a voluntary uh, group of people who have self-selected into we're going to get participants and people see at the table uh, because there are no rules around research data is a major one, and IRBs play a role in that. And they haven't really owned up to I think a lot of their obligations outside of protections of human subjects is empowerment of human subjects as participants. And I think that that is one area that is really ripe for uh, pushing the envelope. And, uh, and a lot of that, you could join, you could be a community volunteer for an IRB and a research institute near you. So that's so one way you can change. Infiltrate, right? It really is, it, it is about infiltrating and also uh, as partners, you know, so I send all the participant partnered literature that comes out to my IRB chair. They just, you know, Holly Fernandez Lynch just did a survey of all IRB chairs across the United States. What do you think about uh, patient partner research? And it was really illuminating. So it's sent, you know, when those things come out and you send them, you socialize these ideas. And that's the only way it's going to change.